Well, hello there. Welcome to Insuring Your Well-Being. I am Dennis James, the bike and dancing insurance man with various insurance plans. And we have a great topic today with an amazing lady that's going to be discussing important things like elder law, estate planning, special needs. She's an attorney and her name is Rebecca Braun with the Mobile Legal Services. Welcome, thank Rebecca. You. Thank you, Dennis. It's nice to be here. Well, how are you? I'm really well, thank you. This is this is pretty neat. I've actually never done anything like this, so I'm pretty excited. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, it's gonna be fun, and we're gonna we're gonna be talking about a really important topic that people need to be aware of, right? So, um, first of all, you have a really unique background, and let's just talk about just tell me a little bit about who you are, you know, and how you got into the profession of being an attorney? Sure. So I um, started my law career. I went to the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law on uh, downtown Detroit. And uh, it was probably my second year of law school. I took an estate planning course, and mm-hmm. I just fell in love with it. I knew that I wanted to work with the aging population and um, helping people understand what their options are. I have never been much of a a litigator. I don't really like to argue. I like to help people. So that's kind of how I got into this particular um, practice area. And I just, I find it's really, um, really rewarding. Yeah. And um, so, I mean, it's, you're unique in that, um, you know, of course, mobile service. So we're going to talk about that. But also, um, you know, I know elder law and estate planning, they're, they kind of play the, the same role, but of course different. And it seems like you work a lot with, it, with seniors. Yep, absolutely. I would say, I, you know, I would say probably maybe about 70% of my clientele, I would say are in the, the aging population. I don't like to necessarily put a number on it, sure. but, um, but I mean, I have clients that are in their thirties too. So it just, okay. it, it's all... All ages, I have clients that are in their 90s. I think I had, I think my oldest was about 101. So that was pretty awesome. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. That's a centurion type person, huh? <laughs> yeah. And he knew, he knew exactly what was going on. It was really, um, really nice to okay. see. Okay. And just real briefly, um, so of course, you know, that's what you specialize. And I know my brief conversation with you, because to me, it's always important to know, and sometimes, a lot of times, the audience wants to know, um, when you're not working, what are you doing? <laughs> Hobbies. Yeah, sure. So I um, I like to travel. That's that's probably my, my biggest thing. Um, mm-hmm. I like to travel internationally. I also like to travel throughout the, the U.S. I um, love to camp. So it's summertime. We've been doing a lot of camping. Okay. Um, I spend time with my rescue dogs. I have um, two dogs that I adopted, Ozzy and Ellie, and uh, they're an awesome part of the family. Um, I like cooking. I like exercising. I love to run. Um, I do a lot of running. Um, that's, mm-hmm. that's probably my... So that's pretty uh, yeah. pretty cool, right? It's well-rounded with what you're doing. You're not always just working, right? You're taking the time to for yourself. Sometimes, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> with the With the dogs and... Uh, uh, and you love traveling, and I, I, I believe I saw, you know, five continents. Yep, yep, and uh, my husband and I are, it'll be our 10-year anniversary, our wedding anniversary in September, so we're planning a trip to Spain this year, so oh, we're wow. very excited. Never, wow. never been there, really looking forward to that. And he's going to bike, you're going to run? <laughs> <laughs> yep, across Spain. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. Well, good. Good for you. Thank you. So, um... You, what I was really struck about you is your, you know, how you, um, with mobile legal services, um, I have never seen any type of attorney that does that. And I, right, it's all about personal touch. You want to tell me about how that happened and how you proceed with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, so... (coughs) When I got out of law school, I started working at a couple different firms and, um, you know, really enjoyed the experience that I received from it. But I decided um, after about five years that I wanted to break off and um, start my own practice. 
and um you know I really wanted to stand out I wanted to do something different I wanted to provide mm -hmm. something special for my clients and I realized that a lot of people have a lot of mobility issues a lot of my clients are either homebound or they have fallen and they're in rehabilitation maybe they're in the hospital or maybe they're just you know busy right so my clients are home with their kids and they're like well I can't really you know grab all my kids and bring them in the car and I can't get a sitter so um, I really try to be as convenient as possible to my clients so I decided that I would travel to them so I don't charge anything for that travel service it's all part of the package it's part of what we do at mobile legal services um, we have been in uh we've been a law firm for 10 years it'll be 10 years in october so we're really proud of that and um, we service five counties so we are in oakland wayne washtenaw livingston and macomb and um the majority of the work that we do is uh, on a flat fee basis i really try to you know I, again just trying to think of what irritated my clients the most in in previous and more traditional practice and i think Clients were getting frustrated with the typical hourly attorney. You know, it's, I don't want to call my lawyer because it's going to cost me something. Or, gosh, I really want to know this, but maybe I'll try to figure it out on my own. And I really don't want my clients to feel that way. You know, I am there for them. I My intention is to be available to the best of my abilities. And I found flat fees really help with that. People know what they're in for. There's no surprises. And, you know, if something comes up down the road, you know, they're able to call me and they're not on the clock. So I think they really appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, um, and I, I would imagine that varies when it comes to a flat fee. Uh, yeah, and, and I can't do that with every case. So I, I should absolutely, you know, mention that. I mean, if it's something, typically if I'm doing courtroom work, um, I'm usually billing hourly just because when it comes to working in the courtrooms and the judges and whatever surprises that may entail, it typically does require just um, an hourly fee based on you know what is involved but um, for, for I would say the vast majority of my cases I'm, I'm taking on at a flat fee. Mm -hmm. And I also notice that uh, you're which is very unique because it is a big deal you're a certified dementia practitioner. Yep yeah I took the course a few years ago really enjoyed it really learned a lot you know I, I think it's the more that we can understand about, I mean, especially I deal a lot with capacity issues, right? I mean, with, with, um, the, with the aging population, you know, some people age really gracefully and some people mm -hmm. have really significant um, difficulties. And, and a lot of that comes from dementia, um, the scary D word that we all hope that we can avoid. But unfortunately, most people will deal with it, whether it's themselves or a loved one at some point in their lives. So mm -hmm. um, I really wanted to, to try to understand that disease as most as best as possible I mean I'm, I'm not a doctor I, I'm not going back to school I'm done with that <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's like the more we can learn that the more we can provide for our clients so I did really appreciate um, learning that I'm also VA accredited so I do also um, work with with um, some VA programs as well so right. those are so kind of my credentials with, <laughs> sure yeah and that's with what the veterans uh, yeah association yes yes so yeah well, I can relate to that, uh, having a dad that was a veteran oh, and uh, being around uh, that with some of his friends mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the veterans benefits when my dad passed and that was very beneficial to my mom. Yeah, no doubt. You know, and a lot of people do not know about that unless they explore it and then I recall talking to an attorney about it, and uh, it made a big difference. Great. For sure. You know, I mean, he served in the Air Force, and so um, should never be underestimated, that's for sure. <laughs> Definitely. And uh, <clears throat> so, you know, different from estate plan, elder law firm, so we talked about that. That's what makes you different with your mobile services, and then... Um, familiar with the state planning, why it's important, and if you, you know, give an overview on it, you know, because there are people, um, even though we're going to be talking, you know, we're doing an overview on everything today that we discuss. Uh, talk about that for a minute, when the way, the role you play in estate planning as sure. far as an overview. 
absolutely. So I think um, when it comes to estate planning, I think most people understand, you know, the basics of it. But, um, I, you know, as an attorney, I, I cannot underemphasize how important it is to, um, you know, have a plan in place. So mm -hmm. the idea, and I think a lot of people think of estate planning as just, okay, well, this is where my stuff is going to go when I die, you know, and it's, it's so much more important than that and so much more broad than that. Um, so there is a lot of misconceptions. Um, I think the, to me, the most important part of the estate plan is planning for incapacity because, you know, it, it, I, I try not to think of it as so harsh, but it's like, you know, when you're gone, when you die, you're gone, right? So you can't do much at that point, but you know, when you're incapacitated, you're still alive. And, and, yeah. and we need to figure out, you know, who's going to make decisions for you, who's going to take care of you. Yeah. And we want to make sure that it's someone that you trust, um, you know, and if, if we fail to plan in that scenario and we become incapacitated, um, our loved ones have to go to court. And then it's up to the judge to decide who's going to make decisions for us. And, you know, I mean, I think probably in most cases that's going to be okay. Um, but there are always outliers. There are people that maybe don't want their spouse to be in that position, or maybe they don't want a certain child to help. You know, there's there's so many scenarios that I see. And, you know, if we just put those powers of attorney in place, then we don't have to worry. It's already taken care of. And the laws state that if you have that document in place, even if it ends up going to court, the judge has to honor your wishes because you put it in writing when you had the capacity and the understanding to make that decision. So that is the, um, the agreement is having that form in place, the, the power of attorney. The power of attorney, yep. And there's, there's two different types. There's a financial and a medical. And some people pick the same person for both roles, and some people pick different depending on, you know, who makes the most sense in those um, particular, for, for those decisions to be made. Yeah, for sure that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, because uh, without those forms, then you got a lot of families that are, right, it can become a lot of issues, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's bad enough, right, but tearing families apart, right, we all know that um, that can happen unless somebody is making the, the, leading the decision, and that was by getting with that particular family member. Yeah. Uh, in my case, it was my mom, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, and, and, and it did make a difference uh, for our family, you know, that way. Yeah. Even though me and my brothers, we all did and we were all there, you know, but I, who knows, I, probably because I was the oldest in the family and. Uh, mm -hmm. I see that a lot. They yeah. must have, <laughs> <laughs> somebody was listening. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, <clears throat> okay, and you mentioned planning for family members with special needs, right? Uh, and I really, I mean, that's a topic. All these could be topics on its own, yep, but that absolutely. one for sure. Uh, I, I'm excited that you're going to, you brought that up, and I'm <laughs> glad you did. So go ahead and hel help the audience understand that, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, it, <laughs> I, I appreciate the way that society has kind of, you know, made it more of a, uh, an easy topic to discuss. And, and I don't, I don't want to use the term easy, but, um, you know, I think as, as we mature as a society, we're more able to talk about, you know, children with special needs and adults with special needs and, you know, what, what do they need in their lives and how do we fulfill that? And, um, you know, the laws have kind of adapted to that. So we have a lot of laws that allow for families with members with special needs or disabilities to really succeed and excel in, in their lives. And um, unfortunately, a lot of families don't realize that they have to plan for these things. Yeah. So we are able to set up <clears throat> trusts. We are able to ensure that family members can inherit funds and still receive their benefits you know, um, the big one of the biggest things that we want to protect at all costs is typically Medicaid because, you know, these individuals with certain disabilities have astronomical medical expenses. And the last thing we want them to do is inherit funds and lose those benefits. So if we plan ahead, we can absolutely protect these, um, these inheritances. We can also protect if people are 
you know, sometimes sometimes it's a, it's a completely unforeseen disability. Well, I mean, I think they're all unforeseen, but, you know, someone can be living their lives and, and be perfectly well and then get in an accident. And right. in that scenario, we're able to protect um, any um, recovery or any settlement um, that they received. So it just, it, it takes knowledge. And I think that's kind of getting the message out there is why it's so important. That's why I'm so happy to be here today is because if people understand that there are options, they will at least ask the questions and explore a little bit and realize that, you know, oh, well, what I hear a lot is, you know, okay, I was just going to, you know, let's say they have a, a younger child and, and they have a disability, but they have an older child who's well. You know, I hear a lot of families say, okay, well, I'm just going to leave all of my money to my older child with the instructions that they're going to take care of my younger child with disabilities. And, you know, that can potentially work, but I'm always weary of things like what if the older child um, gets a divorce? You know, now instead of having maybe their own assets, they now have maybe $300,000 of your assets too. You know, do you think that their spouse isn't going to want half of that? Um, you know, or what if they're in an accident and they're being sued or if they have creditor issues or, you know, I mean, there's just, there's so many possibilities of situations where we really want to just do a little bit of planning ahead of time to ensure that our wishes are honored. And that's my job. So that's where I come into play. <laughs> mm -hmm. I know life insurance, right, is mm -hmm. a funding vehicle. Absolutely. And, um, it's a great way to, to um, ensure that we're caring and, and um, providing for loved ones after we're gone. Yeah, the tax-free benefit of that and mm -hmm. having what kind of um, agreements do you normally call those when you're setting them up? And there could be different types, but... So that's typically known as a third-party special needs trust. So um, it's really kind of basic. A, a, a third-party special needs trust is funded by a third party. So if I'm a disabled individual and my parents die and they leave me money, that's their money that they're giving to me. They are the third party. Now, in my other example, where if I am, you know, a, a functioning person, but then I get in an accident and now I become disabled, any money that I have would be put into a first party special needs trust. And they have different requirements and it's based on IRS code and things like that. But um, basically, I'm able to kind of protect my own money under a first party special needs trust. Okay. Anything more uh, that thoughts on that? Mm, no, I, I think that the, the biggest thing is just understanding that there are options. And I think so many people and I have clients where we're working with children that are, mm -hmm. you know, very young. And then I have clients where we're working with children that are in their 60s. And, and we're like, okay, you know, what's going to happen when I'm gone? How do we plan for this? So keeping in mind that it's never too late and it's never too early. But um, knowing that typically when we're setting up these types of trusts, they are changeable. So we can always make amendments as things go down the road. Um, but I do want to asterisk that with us sometimes we make them irrevocable depending on what our goals are and and every every case is individualized right. so right and that irrevocable means it cannot be changed you're correct yes exactly okay mm -hmm. and uh you know one of the things i don't know i just thought about as as we're talking easter seals right um that normally has a lot of people um all ages special needs disabilities mm -hmm. Um, do you know anything about that at all, you know, without getting a lot into it or not? No, not, not specifically. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just know that it, it it's really right. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if it's national, but it's for sure really big in, 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 in the Oakland community, Oakland County community, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, they're all over and they've bought some other, uh, you know, businesses within that and really making a positive difference it's interesting living in lake orion we have uh it's called a miracle uh field and it's for special needs and it's it's like a half yeah. mile from here you know and it's just so cool because it brings all the special needs people you know 
Mm -hmm. all ages together and it just um, is a real blessing to see how it inspires the community yeah you know and it's set up for that um yeah i appreciate all of that just kind of mm -hmm. thought of that and mm -hmm. then on the elder law you you briefly touched on estate planning and right and you know i keep saying it but each one of these could be separate <laughs> topics for a whole half hour hour and you could go past that but uh, it's good to kind of give an overview and i i love how you know about it and you are an expert in it and that's a big deal right so uh the term elder law you know what the, what does that mean i i think you know i i don't know if it's specifically a defined term right i think it's kind of different for everyone but the way that i approach it is i am you know often contacted by the family of um, an um, aging loved one, mm -hmm. you know, okay, they maybe need long-term care or, you know, their memory's starting to go or, you know, we want to bring care into the home. You know, what, how, how do we pay for this? What does the future look like? These sorts of things. And it's kind of an all encompassing practice because it's not just one area. Right. Yeah. So, and I always, I always kind of laugh because I'm, a lot of what I do for elder law is, is Medicaid. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very familiar with the Medicaid program. Um, I work with the My Choice waiver, but um, more so the long-term care Medicaid. So if someone is entered in a nursing home, mm -hmm. they've run out of money, we yep. got we to we get them, you know, we have to ensure that they're cared for. So that's right. the kind of purpose in Medicaid. And I knew I was going to do that. I knew I was going to go off on a tangent and forget where I was. <laughs> But when, when I'm contacted by the family, you know, they're like, what, what do we do? And so it's, it's always in the back of my mind. And it, regardless of, I should say when I'm working with any client, and it's kind of funny because even when I'm working with my clients in their 30s, I'm like, well, we always have to think about Medicaid a little bit, right? Because mm -hmm. even if it's 60 years from now, we still have to be aware of there are rules and we want to make sure that we're complying with them and that we're not going to do something now that's going to shoot ourselves in the foot later. So right. to me, elder law is understanding these different programs. Like I said, I'm also VA accredited. So I work with a program that's called the VA Aid in Attendance. Yeah. And that is designed to kind of help um, veterans and their surviving spouses pay for long-term care. So, or I shouldn't, it's not just long-term care, but um, care needs as they age. So medical needs as they age. Right. Um, and so my goal is to help people understand these programs, possibly qualify for them. And then once they're qualified, take them through the application process. So that's kind of elder law from a um, benefit standpoint, but then it's also understanding the intricacies of the family dynamics and understanding, you know, again, to the best of my ability, dementia and how that impacts not only the individual, but their families and everybody trying to, you know, navigate this total change in personality sometimes. Um, and so that's where the, the certified dementia practitioner um, aspect comes in. But you know, it's, it's really, it's such an important area of law that um, I think so many people just feel really hopeless when, when they're, um, you know, faced with, okay, yeah. you know, mom or dad has been in rehab, yeah. you know, their 20 days or 90 days or whatever they're going to quote them is up because Medicare, you know, and co-pays and all these fun things everybody has to deal with that they have no idea what they're doing. And now they're getting kicked out and they're like, okay, well, we're told it's going to be $8,000 a month for them to go here and we can't afford it. What do we do? So it's, it's a very stressful time. And I work with an incredible network of people, you know, obviously someone like yourself um, helping the families navigate long-term care insurance yep. and things like that. Um, I work with individuals that help with placement services. I help, I work with individuals in hospice care, um, social workers. I mean, there's just, there's such a, there's such a need but there's so many people that want to help. So it's, again, it's, it's a really cool area to be in. And I, I feel really privileged to be able to help yeah. people the way that I do. Yeah, that's why, you, yeah. I mean, think about it. I mean, just based on what you just said right there, you know, when somebody, right? I mean, you're able to connect people mm -hmm. 
because you already had the network and the resources, mm-hmm. right? And I mean, we do well, a lot of networking. That's how we met, and that's <laughs> how we met. Yep. That's exactly right. You have to know uh, how you can help people, right? It's just like it, when somebody's looking for somebody that needs your specific background. I mean, it's just a blessing to be able to go to you and everybody that's listening right now. It, Right is going to know who you are and how they can contact you, which is really important. Just like me being in this business with long-term care insurance, I realize people are not educated on it, right? So, mm-hmm. and it's a stream of income, just like anything else you do. You know, if it's life insurance, disability insurance, you name it. You know, and if you don't have it, or if you don't have a resource to figure it out, then you know that can be a real issue. It really is always the burden on family members, right, Dad? You know, because yeah. they need to have sources to go to. All right, just a few minutes on this, and then we're going to wrap it up. And I wanted to, just on probate law, because you're just doing such a great job. <laughs> Why don't you just go ahead? And... I'll just keep talking. Okay, perfect. <laughs> so um, the, the other part of my business is I, I do handle um, some probate law. So like I said earlier, I don't handle litigation. <laughs> You know, I'm I I'm not an arguing attorney. <laughs> it's just not my specialty. Um, I learned that very early on. But uh, mm-hmm. I I help people. So when families have failed to plan and they don't have their powers of attorney in place, I will help families um, obtain guardianship and conservatorship if everyone's on the same page. So if everyone agrees, yep, you know whatever sibling or whatever parent or whatever spouse is going to be serving as um, guardian or conservator, that's perfect. And I think there's just, just to kind of back up a little bit. Yeah. Let me, let me explain what those are. <laughs> so guardian is um, court appointed and it is kind of our default if we don't have a power of attorney in place. If we're proactive and have our power of attorney, then the power of attorney steps in when we become incapacitated, away we go. But if an individual becomes incapacitated and didn't plan and doesn't have a power of attorney, our last resort is we have to go to court. And so we go to court and request that the judge appoint a guardian to make um, kind of welfare decisions, ensuring the individual is getting the care they need, seeing the doctor, um, you know, really kind of um, overall health and wellness decisions. And if the individual has a significant um, estate, then we also want to go for conservatorship. So if they've got $100,000 in in savings, we want to make sure that that money is protected as well and that it's used for their care. And so um, we'll request a conservator through the court as well. And that can certainly be a family member that's appointed in that role. But like I said, I'm only stepping in if everybody agrees. If you call me and you're fighting, (laughs) I refer you out. (laughs) Then the other thing that we do in the firm is we handle probate estates. So... Um, and this is again done through the, the probate court. And also uh, it's, it's rare that we're doing trust administrations through the court. Typically trust administrations are done privately, but, but we also handle trust administrations. Um, but probate estates are after an individual has died and they have assets that, um, we aren't able to transfer without the use of the probate court. So Things that have beneficiaries on them mm-hmm. are going to go directly to that beneficiary. Right. So we don't need to use Life the Life insurance, exactly. annuities. Yes. <laughs> all those important. All those important. Things, important things. Absolutely. You've got all those contracts that we create. Those are all going to go directly to the individual's name. Um, if we plan ahead and we set up a trust, anything that's in mm-hmm. that trust is going to go directly to that individual or individuals listed in the trust. However, it's set up by the rules, the terms of the trust. However, if we die and we don't have a will, or if we die and we do have a will, if there are assets that do not have beneficiaries, those assets are generally going to have to go through the probate court. And I always tell my clients when we're in this situation, it's not the end of the world because people go, oh, gosh, oh, I don't want, I just want to avoid the courts. Yeah. Typically, we don't even have to go to court. It's usually just paperwork, process, time, and of course, money. <laughs> right. Yeah, as in wills and trust, having those all set up. Mm-hmm. S- pre-planning. Pre-planning, yep. With pre-planning, we're able to avoid the courts. Yep, okay. absolutely. All right, well, <laughs> so good. 
talk about some great information you gave. That's uh, very impressing. And now tell the audience, Rebecca, you know, how they can reach you and, um, right? Because there's going to be people that uh, when in need, maybe not in need, and they're going to, you know, need to speak to an expert like you. So go ahead and uh, let people know how they could uh, contact you and reach you. Great. Appreciate it. So uh, we uh, offer free telephone consultations, so I'm happy to answer questions over the phone. Um, I do typically try to quote people over the phone. So if you call with an issue and it's something that I think I can help with, I'll, you know, go run through the issue, try to get a broad overview and say, okay, here's what you're looking at um, cost wise. Uh, we do also offer free document reviews. So if you already have an estate plan in place, but it's a little older and you're like, gosh, mm -hmm. I'd really just like someone to take a look at it. I'm happy to do that. I don't charge anything for it. And I'm not going to tell you to redo a document. You don't have to redo. Um, my website is mobilelegalservices.com. Okay. And uh, the telephone number is 734-407-7657. Oh, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was, that was <laughs> great, great information. You're a natural at this, just so you know, Rebecca. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> so, all right. Um, I'm glad everybody tuned in. And uh, please reach out to Rebecca at any time because she's willing to help you and she can make a difference for you in time of questions or needs. In the meantime, have a blessed day and talk to you soon. God bless.